Okay. Well, good afternoon. So we're going to finish out this conference with a conversation about direct primary care. So I know your agenda say that Melina Kimbitsi is going to be up here, but she couldn't be here today from the Alliance. So I'm Bobby Joey. I'm the director of our employer strategy and product development team. So I'll be talking today and leading the panel. But before we get into it, I'm going to let our panel guests introduce themselves. So we have Dr. Singh, Dr. Usher, and Dr. Woodbridge. So if you want to go ahead and give an introduction of yourself, that would be great. So hello, I'm Sabina Singh, a family practice physician going on 30 years now. Um, most of that time I practice with Bellin Health in Green Bay, so a regional community hospital. Uh, it's now Gunderson Bellin in the merger acquisition world, as we all know that's coming. And we also know that Bellin has a health plan too. Um, I was practicing for most of that time as well as part of the administration. And um, basically, as uh, I think Nicole said earlier, uh, moral injury. You start to feel uh, very, you, you can't do the best care for your patients that you want to do. That's probably why all of us have made changes in how we practice and how we do things. Um, as everyone says that people are good, the, we're all well-meaning, um, and so that's what we wanted to, to change. So left Bellin in 2021 to start Anovia Health with a few other partners. Uh, we're independent, unaffiliated primary care in central and northeastern Wisconsin. Um, expanded very, very quickly. There's a huge need, a huge thirst for this. Um, we know employers are looking for change, and we want to be part of that solution. We know patients want better. They want time, they want to get to know us, we want to get to know them. And so it's been an exciting journey over just three years. We've expanded to eight clinics. Um, we'll be up to 15,000 patients. Um, we are happy to work with anyone. We are trying to come up with solutions. Thank you, my name is Dave Usher. I'm a family physician also. I've been in practice, boy, 30 years sounds like a long time. Um, <laughs> Uh, I guess if you count residency, I guess it's 31 years. Um, I was at, uh, I met, I founded Reform Medicine in uh, 2011 in response to the whole um, tainted notion of Obamacare and healthcare reform. Uh, I could see that requiring employers to buy health insurance while not providing any more family practice doctors or any other new new uh, supply of um, healthcare providers was really just going to drive up premiums and drive up deductibles over time, particularly the way they set it up with 100% um, pay for uh, prevention and all the, and the various things. You could just see it coming. And I thought, well, it's either going to wind up socialized medicine and everybody who can afford to buy out of that would go private. Uh, or the thing would constitutionally fail, which it didn't, unfortunately. So uh, I decided I was going to jump out and start a direct pay practice uh, right away rather than spend the next 20 years of my career uh, listening to uh, and commiserating with my patients complaining that they can't afford the simple lab work that I was recommending that they get to manage their diabetes. So uh, I, we jumped out, started Reform Medicine 2011 and 2013. Uh, you guys have all probably heard uh, people make reference to Natasha several times. She is kind of the, the thought leader, uh, at least on our side of the state, with regard to this. But Natasha um, Plank um, came to us. Uh, Plank Enterprises is her um, outfit. And um, we started working with Natasha 11, 11 years ago. And uh, we still work with them. They're, we're their direct primary care uh, provider. And um, since then, we've added about 30 employers and I don't know, I think about 7,000 patients probably and uh, five locations. So uh, I would agree there's just, a, it's, there's an endless, endless potential for this. And I think uh, I, I've gotten pretty smash mouth about what I say um, with regard to this. I used to kind of dance around this, but I think it's, should be illegal, but it's certainly unethical that hospital systems who make money when primary care fails to prevent disease uh, should own primary care. I think that should just be uh, stricken from what's legal in this country, and um, we'll never get to that, but uh, this is the alternative pathway. Thanks for having me. Uh, hi, I'm uh, Dr. Brian Woodbridge. Uh, I took uh, the long way here. Uh, Many of you know here, I used to be a musician. <laughs> Actually got my 
undergraduate and master's in music, so <laughs> taught uh, band and had multiple bands around Milwaukee area. Uh, played at Summerfest a few times, and <laughs> um, I didn't actually become a doctor until uh, I went back to school to uh, get a different teaching certification. That's actually how this all started. But I uh, uh, went back to school and um, uh, actually ended up going to UW uh, Medical School and eventually to Iowa, where I found out you just went. I know there's a lot of Iowa people here, a lot of Iowa uh, University of Iowa people here. Um, I got out and uh, being a musician, I didn't actually know what to do with healthcare. I mean, I have no uh, uh, medical people in my family, so I ended up taking a hospitalist job in uh, Green Bay and uh, eventually worked for Aurora uh, uh, Bay Care up in Green Bay and helped start uh, actually two, two hospitalist programs for Aurora up in that neck of the woods. Uh, so. Uh, some of you know Aurora Bay Care Medical Center up in Green Bay has really turned into kind of a powerhouse up there, but um, started with two hospitalists and now we're up to like 18 or something crazy. Um, and uh, then I also helped uh, start up the Aurora uh, Manitowoc program. Uh, during those years I also, um, because of my years in college and stuff, I enjoyed medical students and um, teaching and uh, so I went to the uh, Aurora Bay Care and said, you know, we should have some medical students up here. I'd, I'd be willing to be their advisor, come up, show them, you know, maybe show them hospitalist work. And they kind of shook their heads and go, that's not a bad idea. Six months later, they said, congratulations, you're the new M3 clerkship director. So, so they ended up doing that for four years, bringing up uh, UW medical students up to uh, Green Bay. And uh, now Green Bay is actually the most popular place in the state for UW medical students to come to. Um, and then uh, eventually I decided to try some outpatient work. And uh, I said, uh, you know, this would be an interesting change. So I uh, started uh, doing outpatient work for Aurora and ended up with three clinics. Um, and uh, that's when I really started to see things from a whole different world was, you know, when you go from the inpatient for so many years and outpatient is when I really started to see a lot of the problems that you guys have been talking about. And I started to understand why there was so much hesitancy by really, really good physicians to go into outpatient work. And believe me, you hear it. Um, and you get out there, and just like many of you have described here, you're going to get out there and you find out, by golly, you know, your schedule starts getting loaded up with uh, people that are very difficult to care for. You're being pushed to see them in seven minutes. Uh, you end up, you know, charting till 11 o'clock at night every day, and this gets to be old really quick. Um, and so that's what really got my head spinning as to where I might want to go with some of this stuff. I go, this, this just seems to be a problem. I mean, everyone told me that 30 years ago you couldn't get an internist to quit their job. You couldn't get them to leave. They'd work till they were 70 years old. They loved their practices. They loved their patients. Now everyone I know in the outpatient world is talking about leaving in their 50s. They want to quit in their 50s. You know, they can't even make it that far. So I said, and I said, that's got, there's, there's a problem here. And that's when I started looking into it. And that's what led me to researching this whole direct primary care movement. And um, at first, I didn't think much of it. Um, I, I really didn't think there was a future in it. Um, but then I started thinking about, I had so many patients that were uh, CEOs, that were business owners, that were small business owners. And, and I started thinking, well, maybe if I apply this, this model towards larger groups and larger people, you know, larger amounts of people, that we could really see something big happen here. You could really see some changes. So that's what led me to start Customized Healthcare Services. Um, I'm kind of the new guy in the block here. We really just got started. Uh, I'd like to just introduce my partner, Dr. Kroll, over there. He's a family practice physician. And I talked to him. I'd heard a lot of great things about Dr. Kroll. And I said, why don't we try to just do this? So we started experimenting around with it. We found a space, opened up. So uh, we started seeing our first employer two years ago. Uh, we now have two larger employers and I think four or five smaller employers. Uh, next year we'll probably double in size, as many of you have noticed, this is growing exponentially. So uh, that's what got me started on this. Um, I have a lot to say about what you mentioned there about what's keeping people from doing it. We can come back to that. So, Thank you. 
So we are going to just delve right in, but um, you know, we've heard a lot the last couple of days about how DPCs really impact the total cost of care, and that is wonderful, but we also know that they impact the quality of care as well. So we're going to dig into that with these panel questions. So I'm going to just open this up to all three of you. If you just want to maybe go into a brief history of um, not a history, but maybe what you feel is different from your practices versus the traditional health systems and how you have modeled your practices to deliver the best care you can and work with your patients. Sabina? Can you hear me? Okay. So I, I think you heard a lot from Nicole earlier about um, the numbers of patients that need to be seen, the amount of work that needs to get done that frankly is clerical as opposed to care, and some of the ways we struggle to communicate with our patients and spend time with them, um, and, the, and the amount of time. So primary care to me is relationships. That's why we went into it. This is how we can make the biggest impact. We have to build trust, we have to care, and you, need, you don't need a lot of other people and you don't need a lot of other things to do that. What you need is time and access, and that can lead to the better quality. Because if I can convince someone help them work through the reason they need to quit smoking, that's gonna have a huge impact on their health. It's very difficult, and you, you just can't do that if you only see them twice a year for 14 minutes, and you don't have time to do phone calls or talk to them or email with them. So the practice is very different. Um, it's same day, next day access, because we know people need to come in when they wanna come in. It's half an hour to an hour. It's any type of communication that works for the patient where they're at, so I've had Meaning, if they want to text, we can text. If they want to do a video appointment, we can do that. Um, we follow regular business hours. People are, are very um, mindful of the time and, and that they're having access to a physician or our care team, which is nurse practitioners and, and PAs as well as RNs. And they know that everybody's pulling for them, trying to help them get better, trying to help them stay healthy, which is really what, what our goal is. So it feels um, incredibly different. I don't know how else to describe it. If you were to come to our office, you'd understand. Um, there's a 30, uh, I should say 30 second check-in the sec second time you come. We know you by name. The staff does, we do. We take you right back to the room, get your vitals, get your medications, just make sure nothing has changed, and then the provider comes in and the visit starts. And it could be a full 25 minutes to 55 minutes of care right at that moment. So that's incredibly different than, um, than you see in the system. I can go on, but I know these guys are also gonna contribute to this too. Well, the thing that, <clears throat> uh, Sabine, the thing you pointed out, and somebody put it on a slide earlier today, was um, trust is low. And that's one of the, um, the kind of uh, empathetic things we point out with employers is, you, you can't trust a system that is going to surprise you with a bill at the end of the month for something you thought was going to be free, and now you've got an $800 or a $1,200 bill, right? People go, oh, I'm here for my free physical. And then they get this bill at the end of the month. Holy crap, what was that? You know, I didn't have chest pain before the physical, and now I do. Um, so uh, it's, and it, you, it's hard to explain, except that you just say, you just need to get your people through our door the first time. Build your program around an incentive in that first year that just says, go there. We will literally do what we call meet and greet visits. You don't have to tell them anything. Don't tell that doctor anything. Just, we want you to go through the door, schedule an appointment, see what that's like, and have the experience of going into that place because it's so different from the big um, monstrous monstr systems um, that treat mill you through like a, a number and like a commodity. So um, getting that, you know, you can, you, maybe you don't need 30 minutes with somebody and you, but you have it. It might only be a five minute thing and you only have to get them in and get them out. But one of the things that patients really um, love is we don't spend a bunch of time checking all these boxes off for this overlord who's watching over my shoulder to see whether I asked about, you know, um, the the 32 year old person whether they feel safe in their home and if they have enough to eat and all these things that are aimed at Medicare age patients and if they're falling down, I mean it's just crazy the stuff that you, the big systems will do to every single person who comes through the door because the system is built 
for the worst off, um, sickest, most indigent person, and then the, everybody gets treated like they fall into that risk category. This way we can treat people like the individuals that they are. If they don't need a bunch of crazy stuff, we don't have to bother with it. It's really a, a, it's a nice way to practice. Yeah, I was thinking that, um, you know, everyone as a sort of a platitude will say, you know, uh, that we all know the value of primary care. People will say primary care is so valuable. You'll hear that out of the BUCA executives, primary care is so valuable. You, you'll still hear it from in general people. The, what I noticed, though, is that there's a big difference between kind of the billionaires that desire primary care because they really desire primary care because we're sort of the goose that lays the golden egg. I mean, we're the people that, that are the gatekeepers for all the specialty care. And um, uh, the difference under this model is that we truly are, uh, you know, we truly are the primary care. We really, we're not just, we're not just a, a, a revenue generator, which is the way big healthcare, you know, see, sees us, um, which is why they keep purchasing them. Every time a group of independents gets out there, within a few years, there's a check being written and getting them right back into the same thing they just left. So under this system, uh, as people keep pointing out, it's, you really get to establish relationships. We really do get to avoid those ER visits. We really do get to avoid those unnecessary referrals. Uh, where did I just read that? Fig they figure, they estimate 40 to 45% of referrals aren't even necessary. They should have never happened in the first place. Um, so, uh, and you, know, you get to see just the most amazing stories. Uh, I, I, I cleared this with uh, my patient before I came here. Uh, but I, I had a patient uh, a couple weeks ago that uh, he, he's actually not one of my employee patients. He's uh, one of our, just our regular family DPC patients. And he's got a, He's got an old Reveal uh, heart monitor in, you know, I think it's been dead for four years. And yeah, he asked, what did it take to get it taken out? And I go, I don't know, who put it in? And he said, oh, Bellin, Bellin, Bellin put it in. So I said, well, go talk to Bellin. So he went and talked to Bellin. And, uh, he, and so about two weeks later, this, is, this would have been last week now, he calls me back. He goes, you, you're, you're going to laugh when you see this. I go, what? He goes, I got to send it to you. So he sent it to me. And uh, I had done a little research. I said, this is not going to be difficult. And he said, well... Uh, Bellin quoted me $55,000 to take it out. And it's, I don't know if you know what a reveal heart, but it's, a, it's about the size of a postage stamp. There's no wires or anything like that. It's just a monitor and the battery is off. I, I said, $55,000. And he goes, yeah, but with the discount, it's only going to be thirty-eight. dollars so, so, And I, I just busted out laughing. And his name is not John, but I said, John, I said, I could take this thing out, drinking a cup of coffee and eating a sandwich. <laughs> And, uh, and I said, he goes, well, how much are you going to charge? I go, I don't even know. I'd have to make something up. <laughs> so, uh, you know, this, this is the, the world we live in now. And, and people look at this and they go, this is crazy. I go, I know it's nuts. You know, this is. So I said, look, we're going to do this right. I said, I'm actually going to call a surgeon I know. And we're, gonna, we're actually going to do this right in the office. And, um, uh, but it's just, it's, like I said, this is where you really start to see the insanity of healthcare, And you can see the gratifying nature of, you know, stuff we can do here, so, yes. The, the, um, I wanted to ask, I, for rhetorical purposes, uh, Terry and uh, Wendell, when they were up here, but I think that you, something you said, everybody knows the value of primary care, but nobody wants to pay for it, right? Um, and I was gonna ask these guys, do, do, the, do the big insurance companies take their lead from Medicare? on how they reimburse primary care versus specialty care, and if they do, why would they do that? Well, the answer is because everybody knows, if you pay attention, that people who have really great access to primary care sp spend less money on health care because primary care is so valuable. If, you can, if we can get people into our office and keep them out of ERs and urgent cares and the, and the specialty referrals that those naturally spin off when people come in for you know, anxiety-driven chest pain to an urgent care, they get EKGs and a bunch of blood work. Well, I think we ought to have you see cardiology and then they'll go see cardiology for a $10,000 workup. Who will then tell them to go back and see their family practice doctor for the anxiety uh, that they was causing their chest pain in the first place, which if they could have just come to see me first would have kept all of that insurance spend, all that next year's premiums would not have been spent 
Um, so insurance companies don't want us to spend less. And if you start putting a really good, solid primary care doctor with whom you have a good relationship and have access to who does effective care, you're going to see the cost of health care come down. And that's not good for anybody but the patient and maybe the primary care doctor. 100% agree. I just, you know, I think the one thing that you touched on, though, Dr. Escher, was if you can just get them in the door for the first time, they're hooked as a patient. And I would say that myself and even as um, for my husband, because the Alliance, we talk the talk and walk the walk. We have DPCs available to us at, at no um, cost to us. And um, fortunately, where I live, I have access to Anovia. So that is what I use. And last summer, before um, my daughter left for Germany for a month, she decided to get pink eye the day before she left. And I ended up texting back and forth with the office and Dr. Singh, like, can we please get some eye drops here? Because they can't get her into it. I can't get her in anywhere else. I'm not sending her to urgent care. Here we go. Eye drops and on our way, but kind of saved the day there. So, yeah, I just think um, it's, it is so invaluable in the care that they provide that I can't speak enough about what our DPCs do for us. So, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Oh. I think Jerry was trying to respond. Yes, oh. respond. Excuse me. How, how large is your patient panel? How large is my patient panel? Uh, well, we have um, five locations, 11 providers. We have one on-site clinic and four, I guess we call them shared site clinics or near-site clinics. So, um, and people can kind of, we're a little different from some direct primary care practices in that people can kind of flex and I don't know if Anovia is this way, but you can kind of flex and see whoever you want. And um, so our patient, our panel of employer patients is, uh, Diane Peterson, by the way, is our chief of operations. There's Diane up front. I'm, I'm looking at her, I'm thinking 6,500 or 7, how many? 7,000. 7, so this will be between 11 providers. Uh, if, yeah, if you work it out, that I should say that we also have, we do some uh, fee-for-service kind of direct pay patients as well. We don't have any individual DPCs. They're all employer-based DPCs. So, but yeah, about 600. Right, yes, it's that's, structurally designed to fail. That's exactly right. When my patient panel at Aurora was, I believe, 2,400. Um, and as you said, our, our, myself and Dr. Kroll's um, goal is about 600 under this model. So that's what we're shooting for. So. Outside of getting patients in the door, what would you see as other barriers to um, DPCs taking, you know, having a bigger impact on the market and bringing in more patients, more employers. What are those barriers to, to that? Dr. Woodbridge, I know you had some <laughs> comments earlier about well, I, that. Yes. Uh, like I said, I'm the, the new guy in the block here. We've been up about two years. And I would say by far the biggest, by far the biggest problem has been um, the uh, trying to get out and teach HR directors, uh, uh, teach the insurance brokers, the value of this. This is so foreign to 80% of insurance brokers uh, and HR directors. They, they can't even fathom it. I mean, they, it's just beyond their, their thinking. Uh, as we've joked about, you know, with your husband and things, you know, in my office, in my conference room, uh, you know, we, we all are fighting over the same four or five insurance brokers that actually understand what it is we're trying to do. Um, that's been, you know, the, the biggest barrier out there is, is, is getting that sort of mid-level barrier to getting to the C-suite, to getting to the CFOs that, that can truly understand these numbers. Um, uh, that's been a barrier. Uh, the second big barrier is, you know, I could, I could talk for an hour about this, um, you know, what it's going to take to get really good docs out of the hospital um, and out of the hospital systems to get them to consider doing this. That, that is a, like I said, a whole talk in itself. Um, a, a big part of it is salary. Uh, as Dr. Usher pointed out, 
um, you got to pay them. This, this is, and, and this is where I have some thoughts that, you know, I was making a darn good salary doing what I was doing, and to come out of that and do this was a risk. Um, most doctors are extremely risk averse. They don't want to even consider this. Um, in order to get them to come out, there's going to have to be uh, something to come in too. Um, and so uh, the paying of primary care doctors and paying them well to do what's right rather than just becoming part of the mill is going to be a difficult nut to crack. Um, and, and like I said, I've had some th thoughts about how to solve this because it takes, I mean, like I said, we're two years into this and, you know, it takes a while to build this. Uh, it takes probably five years to get a good uh, direct primary care clinic going up to the numbers needed to really sustain it. Um, and that just isn't feasible for a lot of people, especially a young one coming out of residency that's looking at $350,000 in loans. It's, it's just not going to happen. I mean, you know, when Freighter comes out waving a check for, hey, we'll pay off 200000 of your student loans and we'll start you at this salary, I mean, there's no way a direct primary care clinic can compete with that. There's just, there's absolutely no way. So those are some of the barriers that, that we're going to have to overcome. I, like I said, I do have some thoughts on that, but that's another, for another day. We saw earlier a slide um, that Mike Roach put up from um, the Alliance, your compadre. And he didn't comment on it, but it was there, and I took a picture of it because I, wanted, I thought everybody should hear about it. From, from the primary care side, it echoes what um, Brian is saying, which is there were two columns. One was the original kind of uh, spend, and then primary care was this little piece up here at the top. The other was this, uh, it was about 25 or 30 percent, 25, let's call it 25 percent cost reduction overall, but the amount they spent on primary care almost doubled. And this is, so this speaks to exactly what uh, Brian was saying, which is um, the whole world is out there trying to figure out how to save costs on a health care plan. And I would argue, and this is a little self-interested, I'll admit, but it goes right to what Brian's saying. We'll never get primary care to grow if we keep taking Medicare and insurance's lead on how you pay for primary care. The difference between direct primary care and fee-for-service primary care is when you have a membership basis as an employer paying for direct primary care, and we know that we have a revenue stream, we can be very flexible, we can take emails, we can do phone calls, we can do texting, um, we can hire that next provider so we can keep our access good. And that's going to be the difference. That's part of the huge difference in using direct primary care as opposed to fee-for-service. You can't expect me to take risk and hire another provider if I'm focused on whether or not eight people are going to, or 16 or 24 people are going to come through the door tomorrow so I can pay my staff. But when we know we have that contracted revenue stream and we know that money's coming in, then we can get really creative with how we deal with our primary care folks. And that's where the real value is. Um, somebody's got to, we're competing as primary care doctors, we're being competed for by all the specialties out there, right? And you're going through med school and you're seeing all these people making really great money doing orthopedics and all these other things. If primary, if they look, go through their primary care rotations in med school and all they do is go to this place out there where there's 40 people who don't speak English and they have two minutes to see these patients in a half day and they come out and go, my God, I'm never doing family medicine. That sucks. You know, which is my son-in-law just went through this. You're not going to get primary care doctors and you're going to always struggle with this. We have to look about, talk, look at, talk about, think about primary care differently if we want those a different set of outcomes from that. So you can't get more value out of primary care and somehow pay less for it. So to the brokers, advisors, that's one expectation I would set right away with people if you're going self-funded is you're going to have to spend more on primary care than what you have traditionally, but the payoff will be a big drop in everything else. I'd like to just just amplify that just one second. So, in my in my opinion, I this is just my thoughts. I think the two big nails in the coffin for 
primary care in the fee-for-service model uh, were, number one, uh, unintended effects of Stark laws and anti-kickback laws. Like I said, I could talk about that for quite a while. The, sec the second big uh, um, uh, in event um, would be the RVU system, and this is kind of what we touched on. I don't know how many people understand the RVU system uh, in this room. Uh, to a doctor, RVUs are how fee-for-service ends up paying for you, and this is how specialty medicine got so big in the United States was that we, we rewarded uh, this RVU, this work rating system uh, the relative value units for what a doctor does, we grossly over-favored doctors doing things rather than doctors thinking about things. Um, and to give some just very quick examples of this, um, uh, when I'm working in the hospital, I used to joke, uh, you know, when I'm, say, in the ICU, um, I used to get paid more on an RVU basis, I'd re get reimbursed more to spend 20 minutes putting a line into someone's heart uh, then I would make the entire rest of the day rounding on patients. I could code someone. I could, I could, you know, give them medications to bring them back to life. I could do all these things. I got paid more in the 15 minutes I put in a line than I did in all the other rounding because of the way the RVU system is stacked towards doing rather than, than thinking. Um, uh, Dr. Makari, uh, I, I laughed when he mentioned to Sergio how he got uh, 25 RVUs for doing a, a, a pancreatic surgery, and I, <laughs> you know, a big RVU in, in primary care is what three? Uh, that's a big day. You know, that's a that's a big RVU for a primary care doc, and so those two events, uh, you know, which, uh, you know, the, the unintended effects of Stark laws, and then the RVU system is really, really what caused the, the downward trend of, of the valuing, the devaluing of primary care physicians, uh, so. Bobby, I'd like to ask a comment too from yeah. a little different Please perspective yeah. maybe, and, and of course we're all in the same boat, we all are, are partners essentially along this journey. Um, I think we need to acknowledge that change is hard. That is the biggest barrier that we're facing, trying to change a healthcare system that's not really a system, or as we would say, a sick care system. And that's where having, like I said, all of us in it together. We talk about it at Inovia as, you know, we are innovating together, we're gonna win together. So everybody has to do their part. The employer is thinking about this, wants to make a change, wants to do better benefits for the employees, keep them healthier. The broker is trying to figure out all these other pieces of the plan, which is complicated. It's already complicated. I mean, the easy thing is to do the fully insured. That's, that, that seems to be much easier than trying to figure out how do I get direct pay here and how do I find care coordination here and where do we actually go to get this taken care of. Um, and then you have the primary care piece. You know, we are the quarterback of care, we like to say. We want to help with that coordination. We want to help with those referrals, those other places where we can get testing done, uh, like the radiology centers that are independent and much less costly. Can we get labs for much less cost? So I think that the biggest barrier is, is, like I said, just getting this movement going, starting to talk about it, starting to make those changes. I, I commend everyone who came today, wherever you are in this process, because it's a start, and you're hearing about things, and there is a lot to be learned from each other. I mean, we all know the value is also the networking and the ideas. So I would take from that approach, yes, for primary care, um, you know, like I said, and we have said multiple times, it, there's a lot of barriers just to primary care. Um, but sometimes the systems have made things a little bit easier for us. We don't have to do a whole lot well to shine a whole lot. The bar is really. pretty low. Yeah, the bar is very low. We talk about that, exactly. So when you get, um, there's a couple things that, whether you're an employer or a broker advisor, there's a couple ways that we talk about uh, things. One, if you want um, a self-funded plan to work, you have to own your primary care. You can't, in my opinion, in my experience with the people we work with, of course, so that's a biased group, but you can't expect your self-funded plan to work well if you're letting your primary care doctors work for a system. They have to work for you. We can't work for your broker. We can't work for anybody. We have to work for you. We won't hold a conversation. We won't go. We won't quote anything for anybody if we're not talking to the CFO or the CEO 
of the employer because giving quotes to brokers, that's just a way for them to beat you down and say, oh yeah, that's too expensive, it's not right for you, we don't do that anymore, we wasted a lot of time doing that. If, we, if an employer wants us to work for them, we'll work for them. We're not working through their broker, we're working for them directly. Now we'll work in concert with their broker advisor person, we're happy to do that because we need to know their plan and that's part of the ownership piece. You have to own your primary care. Um, I, I've been, it's funny you bring that up because when I talk to employers and school districts, they go, say, think of us as your healthcare fiduciary. When I'm working for Aurora, my allegiance is to Aurora. Every time I order a lab, it goes to Aurora. Every time I go a referral, it goes to Aurora. Every time I get an x-ray, it goes to Aurora. When I'm working for you, everything I do is for your your employees, it's for your staff and your company. I said, for the first time in my life, all of the arrows are aligned. By doing what's best for your employee, I'm doing what's best for me. It's, it's helping me out. It's, it's giving my reputation a boost. It's going to make the employer want to pay me more. And then as their employers, employers, employees do better, their company does better, their health care costs go down. I said, it's a first time in my life, it's a win-win-win across the board. I mean, it's so we are your health care fiduciary is what we really are serving as. As a guy who's married to a former health care lawyer, the word fiduciary scares me. Um, but I, I get the spirit of it, yes. We're aligned with you and not with an insurance company, a reinsurance company, anybody else. Thank you. Do the three of you have any other comments? Or do we have any questions from folks that are out in the crowd? It sounds like each of you have built your own practices, your own buildings, things along that lines. And as I'm learning more, this is some the first exposure I've ever had to it, I'm wondering why I don't hear more on the like, home care or visit to a company to provide care. Um, it sounds like it's, it's to a building or a certain location. Are you expanding or looking into different avenues of care to provide on site? Or? The question was, um, what about other uh, venues besides just having a clinic somewhere on a street corner? Um, do you go to home care? Are you expanding? Are you doing other things? Um, the that's a great question, and um, it, it depends on your geography to some extent. In the rural side of uh, Wisconsin, where things are, there's just people spread out everywhere, right? Eau Claire, 70,000 people. Um, we've kicked around the whole, gee, we should do home visits and we should do this and that. But by the time you spend, um, if you send a provider driving to all of these places, it's really cost prohibitive because uh, they just spend half their day driving. Um, and then when you get out into some of the smaller towns, like we have a clinic in Menominee, we have one in Chippewa Falls, uh, we have one, in our big, bigger clinics in Eau Claire, and then we have another uh, site in Hudson. And that's, so that's a cross 70 mile span. And there's lots and lots of people in there who live, people love to live in the country in Western Wisconsin. I don't know if that's true over on this side of the state or not. There's not much country over here. It's kind of a big interstate from here to Green Bay, but, uh, over there, there's lots of open land, and so uh, we have looked at that and thought about it, but um, what crosses that void to some extent is the virtual care. So if somebody doesn't want to drive 40 minutes and we can handle it by an e-visit, we will do that uh, for sure. Um, but as far as expanding goes, we will go wherever the employer is if, if there's enough business there. It's a business decision, right? Um, I, it, all of us would probably love to have a presence in every town if we could have it, but there's got to be enough business there to be able to pay your provider and pay your staff. So um, that would be my response. Does that answer that from my perspective? Yeah, and I would answer also, um, we have looked at on-site. We do get asked. We found for us, on-site worked best with having RNs, with engagement, with being able to walk out into the plant or the workspace, informally talking to people, picking up those social uh, determinants that we might not get in the office, but to tie up a provider in an uh, in a on-site, depending on the structure, um, could actually inhibit people from coming because everybody knew they were going to the doctor. And what are you going for and why are you down there? So you have to be careful how that's set up in terms of privacy. 
Um, people didn't want to go there for certain things. And sometimes on-site is looked as, as OC Health, as workers' comp, um, urgent care, less so the full primary care. But there's no right or wrong way. You've seen all these different things. People do do home visits. Um, like Dave said, the uh, technology is just so much better. And there is, there's technology out there to listen to lungs, to put something, a light in your mouth, to put something in your ear so that we can actually get pictures. Um, set the scopes to listen to the heart, if all that is truly necessary. Again, uh, primary care is relationships and understanding where people are at. So, you know, if you want to come in two or three days early, get your blood test for your diabetes, and let's have a video visit two days later so you don't have to make a second trip. I still need that blood test, so you got to get that somehow, right? You got to get the weight, maybe the blood pressure, but we can do the rest of the visit video and talk to each other and get that all figured out. Um, I have done a visit on a golf course for somebody. That was his choice, not mine. So, you know, truly trying to be accessible. I saw a lady while she was in Coles once. See? <laughs> so people do call us or expect that. Anyways, so you're right. There's all different models out there. There's no right or wrong answer. Um, we chose ours as near site because it also maximizes the provider time. We want to be very sensitive to that. Yeah, I'll just say the same thing. You know, we, we maximize phone visits and televisits a lot. Um, as many of you know, uh, as when you work for the big health systems, you're encouraged to do things to, to, uh, to get people to do, say, um, well, they need their Lipitor refilled. Well, I'm not going to refill it until you come in for a visit, right? And then you get to charge them for a problem visit because it's not a wellness visit. You get to charge them for, you know, 99214 and they come in and all you did is refill their Lipitor. Well, under this system, that's all out the window now. And you really find out that, gosh, about 80% of those people coming in for visits were stuff that you didn't even really need to come in for. You could just call up and say, hey, you know, I need my tunnel all refill. How's it going? Just fine. Yeah, you know, I mean, it, it's, that's the one thing that's really been an eye-opening experience is just how many things that we used to do and demand that they come into the clinic and spend 300 bucks for, then, you know, you could just do over the phone. So. One of the things I will add, I didn't mention this before, but um, one of the things that has, well, two things. Um, one is when we started, when I started reform medicine 13 years ago, um, one of the visions we had for it was we need a place where patients will feel safe, providers will feel safe, and staff will feel safe. It'll be a gratifying place to work. And everybody will come here and go, yes, this is what it's really supposed to be like, right? I mean, that, and that wasn't a direct pay, you know, cash transaction type of thing. We're going to have accessible, affordable, effective health care. And everybody who does it is going to think it's great because we're going to figure out the, the model that gets everybody paid fairly and, and feels different and doesn't burn people out. Uh, the second thing, one of the things that we do is I'm also... Uh, it's not strictly a board certification. I'm a diplomate of the American Board of Obesity Medicine. So we do a ton of, um, that's a bad pun. We do a lot of <laughs> obesity visits. Um, we follow about 350 patients a month uh, for obesity and um, have out just, I, don't, I would say it's world-class results. And um, so that, when you bring on a new employer, when we get an employer who uh, comes on board with us, the first, depending on the size, but the first 20, 30, 40 patients who are going to schedule appointments are those people who've been looking for a really effective way to treat their overweight status. And the, the big systems kind of have run away from that, or they just defer them off to the dietitian. And as Marty was saying, they usually get bunk advice and never really lose much weight. Uh, but we really lean into that at Reform. That, that was something I was doing at Mayo for a number of years before I left there. And um, so when you put that primary care and a, an incredibly effective weight loss strategy together and you can start pulling people off of drugs and see their IBS and their asthma and their arthritis and their eczema and all these things you don't think of as diet-related problems uh, get better, man, is that, a, that is just a cool thing. That's a lot of fun. Uh, it makes primary care so much more um, easy, I guess. All right, so we're going to probably get kicked off the stage here pretty soon. I'm sure you guys want to get home, but thank you very, very much, the three of you. Thanks, everybody, for your attention. Thank you.